tonight on The Readout. And at long last, this national nightmare that we're going through will be over. Women will be happy, healthy, confident, and free. You will no longer be thinking about abortion because it is now where it always had to be with the states and with the vote of the people. Lord help, Trump is still spouting nonsense as Vice President Kamala Harris builds momentum with some very positive new polls and growing enthusiasm. Also tonight, the significance of all the star power on Harris's side, which really gnaws at Trump, who only has has-been stars like Hulk Hogan and some celebrity's dad or their brother and a few other folks who were briefly relevant 40 years ago. And we begin tonight with the 43-day sprint to November 5th. And if you're feeling kind of tense, not super loose, you are not alone. I think everyone who is paying any amount of attention to this election is some combination of excited, anxious, and thoroughly freaked out. But we have officially entered the period where the election isn't coming. It is here. It's happening, y'all. And in a few weeks, just a few weeks, we will find out if this country will face another Trump administration, With all that means for the future of our democracy, including mass deportation and Project 2025 and whatever it is J.D. Vance would do with executive branch power, or if we will turn the page to a Kamala Harris, Tim Walz administration. In a number of states, people are already voting. So we're already getting scenes like these long lines of early voters in Virginia. But the early voting process has not gone off without some hitches. In Montana, the state had to shut down the site that generates electronic ballots for overseas voters due to a pretty big screw up. Kamala Harris's name was left off the ballot. Donald Trump, RFK Jr. and the libertarian candidate, a guy named Chase Oliver, all got on the ballot, but not the sitting vice president of the United States. Funny. I wonder who that vendor is. In other states, like Georgia, lawsuits are being filed, already challenging the way elections are being run. We will all be up on pins and needles on November 5th or whenever the Peach State finishes hand counting the millions of ballots that will likely be generated. However in the world they're going to do that. And whether lawsuits will prevent whoever wins these states where Republican election deniers have a role from being certified in their state elections at all. North Carolina politics, meanwhile, has been turned upside down by the salacious and bizarre revelations last week that the current lieutenant governor, Mark Robinson, who is the Republican nominee for governor, not only allegedly frequented porn sites, he also hung out in the chat rooms as a character called Mini Soldier, making wild pronouncements, calling himself a black Nazi, disparaging MLK and saying slavery was a good thing and that he'd buy a few slaves himself if he could. Also, that he enjoys the transgender porn and some other stuff I won't even repeat on cable. Robinson has denied the allegations, but over the weekend, most of his campaign staff quit, leaving him with a skeletal team, along with Donald Trump's continued endorsement. Although when Trump campaigned in North Carolina on Saturday, he did not repeat that Robinson is Dr. King on steroids or even mention him at all. On a national level, Kamala Harris's campaign continues to be nothing short of a juggernaut, meanwhile, raising more than twice as much money as the Trump-Vance campaign and overwhelming them on the ground in swing states. New polling shows Harris gaining more popularity in the past few weeks than any candidate in the 35-year history of the NBC Wall Street Journal poll. She's gone from a 3250 deficit to a 4845 positive rating. In a head-to-head race, she's now beating Trump with black voters, 18 to 34-year-olds, women, independents, and importantly, white voters with a college degree. She's leading by 28 points on which candidate would protect immigrants' rights, by 21 points on abortion, by 20 on which candidate has the necessary mental and physical health to be president, by 16 who has the right temperament to be president, and by nine points on which candidate represents change. For his part, Trump leads by 21 points on who would best secure the border, by nine points on who would do best on the economy, and by eight points on who would better deal with the cost of living. Improved numbers for Harris, but with the economy and cost of living the most important issues to voters in the poll, it's the reason the race remains close. 
But even with all that data, what we're seeing on the Republican side is not just a, a weird lack of actual campaigning in swing states like Michigan, where Republicans are complaining that there are basically no Trump Vance campaigners and this warped mass campaign to demonize immigrants from seemingly randomly picked non-white countries, Haiti, Venezuela, and now Trump has added the Congo, plus a MAGA push to simultaneously radicalize Puerto Rican voters and black men against VP Harris and for Trump. What we're seeing is this clear campaign among Republicans to convince their base voters, not that Trump is destined to win, but that if he doesn't win, it will be because non-citizens somehow flooded the polls to vote for Harris. Despite the fact that immigrants know almost nothing about how anything in our system works, they are supposedly being corralled into the voting booth by Democrats or by the Jews to vote for Democrats. And for the Republican base, increasingly, it seems that the only way they would trust the results of any election is if every single voter enters the voting booth with armed white Christian poll watchers stop and frisking and interrogating them and then writing their vote on a little slip of paper, which is then counted by hand and maybe, I don't know, handed back to the armed white Christian soldiers. And even then, only after each voter registers to vote by hand delivering their original birth certificate, no copies, plus a driver's license and a passport to the voter registrar with no discrepancy at all between the names on each of those documents. By the way, that part about the birth certificates and the documents is what's literally in the SAVE Act, the bill Republicans named as a must-pass part of the legislation to fund the government and not shut it down. And here's the hitch that some eagle-eyed journalists spotted. Those rules would eliminate from the voting rolls possibly millions of married women whose names on their birth certificates most certainly do not match the name on their driver's license or passport because of how marriage usually works. People often, you know, change their surname to their husband's last name. So in those cases, women voters would have, have to also have a marriage certificate. They'd have to produce that and give it to the voter registrar or whatever other maximum proof Republican base voters deem necessary. Also, I wonder how J.D. Vance, whose birth certificate says James Donald Hamel, how would he be eligible to vote if the SAVE Act passed? Anybody thought that through? Between all of that and the frenzy to register new voters, particularly young voters who are signing up in massive numbers, according to Vote.org, particularly since Taylor Swift endorsed Kamala Harris, but are notoriously difficult to poll. And the aggressive move by Republican state parties and governors in red states and swing states to purge tens of thousands and in the state of Texas, more than a million voters as fast as they can register with conservative groups even suing local counties to try to remove voters from the rolls in up to 19 states. We are clearly, clearly in for a long and bumpy 43 days. And joining me now to help disaggregate all of our emotional stress <laughs> and is our terrific Monday panel, Tim Miller, writer at large for The Bulwark and host of The Bulwark podcast, Simon Rosenberg, political strategist and author of The Hopium Chronicles on Substack, and Don Calloway, Democratic strategist, founder of the National Voter Protection Action Fund and host of the Caucus Room podcast. Everybody's doing podcasts and all these wonderful things. I'm going to go right down the middle to Simon Let's go through these polls. You're the hopium guy. So, yeah. so let us know whether we should be hopeful or just read the yeah. New York Times Siena poll in despair um, because they pretty much seem to be calculated to make you despair. Um, NBC yeah. News poll. Uh, positive views of Harris. She's now 48, 45. The NBC News poll, her advantages among black voters, voters 18 to 34, women independents, and crucially white voters mm -hmm. with a college degree by 21. And then this key issues poll. She's she's leading on protecting immigrant rights, abortion, mental and physical health to be president, temperament, change, um, and Trump goes with border and the other things. And then one more I'll throw in the Hispanic numbers. There's been a lot of despair about and worry and concern about Harris being soft, uh, scoring softer with Hispanics than Biden did. She's she's creeping up in that. Uh, what do these polls tell us, if anything, about where things really stand with 43 days to go? Yeah, I would much rather be us than them. I mean, I think we've gained, you know, she was already in a better position uh, than Donald Trump before the debate. I think the debate did change things a point or two in her favor. And she's running in most polls. And I will say there are some polls showing something different. But in most polls, she's hovering around Biden 2020 numbers now, both at the national level and in the key states. 
And so where I think the race is now is we're in a much better position than them, but we're not still where we want to be. And we still have work to go do together to make sure that we win this election because Biden 2020 was really close. And we don't want this election to be as close as the 2020 election. But we have momentum. We have a far better candidate. We've got a stronger argument. And I think something you alluded to, Joy, in your in your uh, run up is that we also have enormous financial organizational enthusiasm advantages and obviously much bigger crowd sizes. And so I think all that together means that as we go through these next 43 days, I think it's more likely we win than them. But we still have an awful lot of work to do. Right. And Don, you know, the thing about our kooky election system is that Democrats are built to win the popular vote. You know, it's very hard for Republicans to win it because they have such a narrow coalition that's sort of very, that's almost monoracial. It's not completely monoracial, but it's it's close to it. Um, but Democrats have to win the popular vote, you know, conversely, by an enormous spread in order to carry the Electoral College. So Hillary Clinton can win by three million and lose. And, you know, Joe Biden can win by five million and win. And President Obama, he won by 10 and then five. So so there is still a lot of nervousness. And one of the things that's making a lot of folks nervous is this aggressiveness to pull folks, folks off the voter rolls. Mm-hmm. It's been super aggressive on the part of Republican governors and uh, secretaries of state. So how concerned are you that all of these eager registrars, including young people, are actually going to have their right to vote enforced? Well, I think that everyone who is watching the democratic process should be extraordinarily concerned about that. And the reality is that part of civic participation baked in going forth, particularly from groups on the left, has to be aggressive voter protection. And we focus so much on registration and then get out the vote, but we've done nothing really substantially as a large, writ large party organization over the last 15 to 20 years, since we've been running diverse candidates, by the way, which we need to actually hold these offices. We've done nothing to protect the actual votes that will be cast. But this should be a golden rule. There's no universe in which changing voting procedures and rules 90 days before an election or within this window should be remotely legal. So whoever's ready to bring that as a federal lawsuit, I'm more than happy to help support it because there's no universe in which people can be educated about how to vote in time now when you're making rules changes. It's blatant voter suppression at its most pernicious. And it's happening where we saw Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act taken away in Shelby versus Holder in 2013. So I, 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 you know, I love your show so much, but it's always important to pull all the way out and show that broader historical context of what's going on and how this is all connected 43 days before you could potentially elect a black woman president. So there are lots of procedural substantive hurdles between right now and the ballot box. A- 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 amen. Amen. And we appreciate it because it's, you're, you're absolutely right. And Tim Miller, you know, that say, saying all that, there are a lot of headwinds facing Donald Trump. I mean, he, he, uh, Lindsey Graham tried to get Kansas to get rid of their winner take all system and get rid of that one district that could be one electoral college vote. Biden won it. It's typically won by Democrats. That didn't work. Uh, there's a, you know, essentially a no from a very key Republican who could stop that from happening. Obviously, the Mark Robinson hot mess. Um, it's happening uh, in uh, the state of North Carolina. And then there's this save act thing. They tried to push through this save act. And I'm going to put this back up on, on the, on the, on the screen. It would require proof of U.S. citizenship to register to vote. It would not allow a driver's license alone as proof. Most people don't have a passport in this country. Only about a third of Americans do. Would require some secondary documentation, like a original birth certificate with the same exact name. Tim Miller, J.D. Vance could not pass that test, that three-part test, because his name is not J.D. Vance. That's his nom de guerre. He, he made that name up. So they're at this point, and they couldn't get the save back through, but that was their plan. Did they even think of poor J.D.? Um, J.D.'s changed his name like three times, I think. Uh, yeah. So uh, he, he needs a lot of documentation if he's going to be able to vote in Ohio <laughs> uh, if that save act had passed. Uh, so, yeah, I'll hit all three of those uh, quickly. There, it took me a second. When using Mark Robinson in hot mess in the same sentence is is not appropriate for cable news, uh, Joy. So that kind of derailed me, my, my brain a little bit there for a second. It's cable. Um, but, sorry, but uh, the uh, Save Act. The good news is that um, Mike Johnson has folded on that basically, right? And so, uh, the, luckily, 
uh, right now, the Democrats still uh, are in charge of the Senate. Um, that's that's another thing that's going to be a big uh, question here going into the midterms. Uh, but they, they weren't going to be able to jam this thing through, and they've, they've kicked it down the road. They're going to now try to shut down the government at Christmas. Yeah. Merry Christmas, everybody. That's the Republicans' plan now. So that they're trying to tie the state back to that. So I think as far as this election is concerned, uh, that's not a problem, though. Down the line, that's going to be something to continue to monitor, as, as Don points out. As, as, as far as the uh, other uh, thing is concerned, Nebraska is really quick. I, I think you said Kansas, but yeah, is that Nebraska? Sorry, district. Nebraska, Nebraska. Yeah, no. Yeah, just to be clear. But um, yeah, and my colleague, Joe Pertico, on the Bulwark just talked to Deb Fisher, the Nebraska senator, who confirmed that that's dead. That's really good news for the Democrats, because that Nebraska di- district could be 270. It, it's Omaha. It's represented by a Republican, but Obama won it, Biden won it. And if uh, and if Harris wins the blue wall states, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, that only gets you to 269. And that would throw the election to the House unless you win that Nebraska district. So that is huge that the Republicans were not able to do any late game dirty tricks in, in Nebraska. Yeah, absolutely. And so, I mean, I mean, one of the keys for Democrats to win those three states is women. And you and I have had a lot of this conversation about how critical the abortion issue has been. Harris leading among uh, college educated white women is actually a pretty big deal. Donald Trump's reaction to that is to say, no, 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 no. Women will be happy, healthy and confident and free under his under his presidency. It's all so it's all good. How how solid do you think the vote of college educated white women is for Harris? Because traditionally it is still a Republican vote. Who do you want to grab that, Joy? You want me to take that? You, Simon. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Okay. You, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Listen, it's, you know, one of the most remarkable things I think about this current moment in the abortion debate is Donald Trump has this thing he says, which he thinks we all believe when he says it, which is, you know, I've put the vote back in the states where it belongs. But what he did by putting the state back, the vote back in the states where it belongs, is he took it away from women. And, do- and their doctors and gave it to Republican politicians. And it's really, yeah. in some ways, the most one of the most um, incredible things that he says for how just openly and incredibly dishonest it is and how pernicious it is. Look, listen, they're in a lot of trouble. I mean, you know, we've got ballot initiatives in a lot of these battleground states. We've got the ballot initiative down in Florida. Women are fired up in this election. You know, the voter reg surge that you've talked about is coming mostly from women. The intensity that we're seeing in the Democratic coalition is being driven to a great degree by the by the women of our of our broad coalition. Um, you know, I think that every election since Dobbs has we've overperformed expectations. They've underperformed expectations. We've had this heightened sense of the gravity of the election in front of us. That is still the case. I think that's going to be the case in this election too. And I think, yeah, these numbers are very encouraging. And I think that, you know, I, for example, in the New York Times poll today, they don't, they have, you know, the voter intensity with women and registration numbers, they have similar to 2020. And that's just not right. going to be the case in this election. So I'm, I feel good about where we are. But as I said earlier, yeah. we still have a lot of work in front of us. Rapid fire. We're out of time. Don Callow, will there be another debate? Trump just seems to be iffy on it. I would like to see it, but I don't think it's going to happen. I'd like to see it happen at Virginia State, the black school that got one first time around and was denied the opportunity this year. Uh, but it yeah. doesn't look like it's going to come together in this short Tim, window. Tim Miller, will he have the courage to do it? I, I kept saying yes, and I'm starting to I'm starting to uh, to lose my confidence on that. I just want like. <laughs> Are you really not man enough to go up against her again? I just eventually I thought his ego would get in the way, but I, he might be yeah. so delusional and kind of convinced himself that he won that maybe he doesn't do it. Maybe he should tap in Mark Robinson and let him do it for him. That's a, how about that? Tim Miller, Simon Rosenberg, Don Calloway. I mean, Mark would probably do it. Uh, thank you all very much. Coming up, a deeper look into undecided voters and what it will take for them to actually pick a side and vote. We are now 10, I'm sorry, we are now six weeks away, six weeks away from Election Day. And people are already voting in states across the country. But a lot of voters remain undecided about a vote for Vice President Kamala Harris or Donald Trump, who I will remind you is running for the third time and has incited a coup and gotten convicted of 34 felonies since his last run for president. Maybe some of these folks are truly undecided voters. And then there are people who aren't voting for Trump, but who, for whatever reason, just need to hear more from Kamala. People like New York Times columnist Brett Stevens, who wrote last week that Vice President Kamala Harris needs to do more to get him over his unease about voting for her. Stevens explained what he wanted in a 
in an appearance on Bill Maher and got taken to school by my colleague and pal, Stephanie Rule. I don't think it's a lot to ask her to sit down for a real interview as opposed to a puff piece in which she describes like her, her feelings of growing up in Oakland with nice lawns. Then I would just say to that, when you move to Nirvana, give me your real estate broker's number and I'll be your next door neighbor. We don't live there. Do you know, for the last two weeks, I've been going on and on. Like, I can't figure out where undecided voters, where informed undecided voters are. I'm like, who's the person who has a list on their refrigerator of like, well, she said this and he's, I'm like, who is this person? And then I opened the New York Times three days ago and it's you. (laughs) Boom. Brett Stevens is one kind of fence sitter, but a huge Gen Z pop star is getting criticized for another type of election fence sitting. Chapel Roan, the queer Gen Z pop singer who hails from rural Missouri. Her career took off this year. You may have seen her perform at last week's MTV VMAs. Last month, she told Rolling Stone that she declined an invite to perform at the White House because of the government's support of Israel's war in Gaza and noted that she's not a fan of Donald Trump either. In an interview with The Guardian, she said, quote, I have so many issues with our government in every way. There are so many things that I would want to change so I don't feel pressure to endorse someone. There's problems on both sides. I encourage people to use your critical thinking skills. Use your vote. Vote small. Vote for what's going on in your city, unquote. Not surprisingly, that literal both sides from an ardent fan and defender of drag performers hasn't gone over well with some of Roan's Gen Z and LGBTQ fans. Organizer Olivia Juliana posted on X, pretty sure there's only one side painting drag queens out to be pedophiles and trying to outlaw gay marriage and trans people existing. Worst kind of political opinion indifference. But Chapel Roan's comments aren't nearly as head scratching as what one of Gen X's biggest music stars had to say about Vice President Harris. Spoiler alert, her name is Janet. Miss Jackson, if you're nasty. That's coming up. Okay, let's talk about Janet Jackson's escapade. And no, not the song. When the singer was asked about the prospect of America electing a black woman president, she said of Harris, quote, well, you know what they supposedly said? She's not black. That's what I heard, that she's Indian. Her father's white. That's what I was told. I was told that they discovered her father was white. Yeah, that's not true. But They do. Those words do echo Trump saying that Harris magically turned black. And yet it gets worse. When Jackson was later pressed whether she thinks America is prepared to see Harris in office, she said, I think either way it goes is going to be mayhem. Either way. Jackson's comments generated outrage online until a credited producer on her upcoming documentary walked it back before that person was seemingly fired, leaving it unclear whether Ms. Jackson still believes that Kamala Harris isn't black and really is willing to tell her billions of fans that there's no difference between Harris and Trump. It's a weird sequence of events, but Jackson is not alone. There's a host of celebrities who have made bizarre comments in actual support of Trump, who has long depended on endorsements from celebrities and manoverse influencers, mostly because reputable experts and political figures have largely abandoned him. Still, the reality is, is that all campaigns want celebrity endorsements. Analysis from Harvard University's Ash Center shows it works. And it's, quote, incredibly powerful when centered around calls to action, like registering voters or poll worker signups. And it is worth noting for those counting, when it comes to celebrities, VP Harris has a massive list. And it's really a list, up to and including Oprah, who might be the biggest endorsement get of all. Trump, on the other hand, has a C-list, although he he does have the parents of some A-listers to keep Hulk Hogan and Kid Rock company. Joining me now is Alencia Johnson, former senior advisor to the 2020 Biden-Harris campaign and author of Flip the Script, The Everyday Disruptor's Guide to Finding Courage and Making Change. I love that idea. I love that uh, book idea. Alencia, thanks for being here. Let's start with, I want to go back to Janet Jackson because I originally didn't want to really do this story because I, you know, I'm really not trying to embarrass Janet Jackson. You know, I just don't, I'm a big fan of hers. I grew up listening to her, but I I think about the power of her. I was just at Essence Fest this year. She performed. Her fan base is massively black women. Um, Black women all around the world are her core base. And if she is this subject to misinformation and disinformation, 
I feel like she actually does have the power to spread that disinformation and misinformation. And that winds up disempowering black yep. voters, black women voters black in particular. Women. What do you make of it? Well, look, we know that disinformation and misinformation spreads rampant in black communities. And the way in which we engage them is actually through a lot of culture mechanism. Not everybody is, well, I'd like to think everybody's watching us, Joy, but a lot of people aren't watching cable news in the way that we think they are to get some of their political messaging. And as you mentioned, Janet Jackson has a huge fan base. Look, I was a Janet Jackson fan before I was a Beyonce Beehive member, right? She also has talked about racism and sexism and discrimination in her music. I mean, all of the Jacksons have, right? And so I think it is great for us to talk about it because people are a little bit disappointed. Uh, and this is a, an example of, to your point, how fast this information spreads rampant and how it's so important for us to combat it everywhere, especially in the digital space where pop culture and entertainment spreads a lot faster than truth and news. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is that these celebrities, you know, they, they have a power. And we were, we were talking about this on the call earlier is what is the power of celebrities? Like, how do campaigns really use them? And, you know, and my take just from the campaign side is they don't necessarily make somebody who didn't want to vote for candidate a vote for them, but they can make someone who is open to it register, actually, or, or sign up to vote or go out and early vote or just commit. Right. They can get people to commit. Um, but when they're actually just being messengers on like politics and policy. Let me just let you listen to what, what uh, John Legend had to say about that. I think fans and audiences should be careful about wanting us to weigh in on everything because honestly, like, no, the depth and the breadth of understanding necessary to contribute meaningfully to the conversation right. is actually like just not there for most artists. And you can't really blame them. This is not what they do every day. You know, right. like they're musicians, they're actors, they're uh, in the public eye. And you want them to use that platform for good. But also you want them to do it with a sense of understanding and knowledge and wisdom and connection to activists and organizers and experts. And everybody's just not able to do that. Alensa, you're actually teaching a course on this. How do we get that balance right in politics? Yeah, look, my first actual political job was doing surrogate communications work for Obama's reelection campaign, working with a lot of celebrities to refine their messaging. Because what we find is that oftentimes it's not the message, it's the messenger that will, to your point, get voters from the couch to the ballot box or get people who are going to vote to actually start organizing and mobilizing. And I agree somewhat with what John Legend has said. And what I have found in working with the entertainment industry and in a lot of my jobs is that celebrities, yes, they're artists, but they are also people first, right? There are issues that they care about, whether it's reproductive rights, racial justice, and a lot of times, particularly marginalized voices, will use their art as a form of protest and amplifying the message. If we look at last year, Hip Hop 50, Hip Hop was birthed out of a protest movement from Fight the Power to F the Police to UNITY to all of the things that Meg Thee Stallion and Lotto have said about these abortion restrictions. They are using their art as a form of not only protest and education, but galvanizing. And the other thing I'll say, too, Taylor Swift endorsed uh, the night of the debate. Well, Vote.org saw almost 30,000 voter registrations within 24 hours of that endorsement. Yeah. That is the power of celebrity. So they're not helping people decide on who they're going to vote for. They're helping people decide that they are actually going to vote. Yeah, uh, it, it's interesting because, it, you know, we didn't get a chance to talk about it, but there's the, there's the risk in it, too. I mean, Nikki Jim uh, getting said about him, she's hot by Donald Trump is like and he's now getting like just pilloried by his fans. But meanwhile, on the Democratic side, they're like waiting on Bad Bunny. <laughs> they're like, come on, come through Bad Bunny because it can really help us with Latino voters. So everybody wants the celebrities and they do help in certain ways. Alencia Johnson, thank you so, 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 so much. Coming up, um, fears of a wider war as tensions rise in the Middle East. Sunday, an MSNBC special presentation, Black Women in America. MSNBC Simone Sanders Townsend and Melissa Murray offer an in-depth look at the unique power Black women hold in this year's election and what candidates can do to earn their votes. We have to let our voices be heard so that the system can work for us. It's a time of opportunity, but also of hope. Black Women in America, Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern on MSNBC and streaming on Peacock. What's causing the rise in book banning? On my podcast, Belshi Band Book Club, I speak with authors of banned books to try and find out. Season two of Belshi Band Book Club. Listen now. 
Israeli airstrikes have killed nearly 500 people in Lebanon as thousands flee the south of the country near the border with Israel. It's the deadliest day of the Israel, the Israel Hezbollah conflict since 2006. The prime minister of Lebanon accused Israel of waging a war of extermination. Israel's defense minister said they would keep up the strikes until they achieve one of their war goals, which is returning evacuated Israelis safely to their homes. Last Tuesday, hundreds of pagers distributed by Hezbollah to members and associates in Lebanon and Syria exploded, killing at least 12 people, which included children. The shocking move, which raised the question of the safety and hackability of cell phone technology itself, left 3,000 people maimed and wounded. The following day, thousands of two-way radios exploded, killing 20 people and wounding another 450 people. Israel did not confirm or deny any role in the explosions, but according to the New York Times, a dozen current and former defense officials confirmed that the Israelis were behind it. Joining me now is Ronan Bergman, staff writer for The New York Times Magazine and author of an exceptional Times investigation detailing how violence and terrorism by Jewish ultranationalists has gone unpunished and enabled the growth of an extremist movement that now threatens the country itself. Uh, Mr. Bergman, it, it is such an honor. Thank you so much for being here. I listened to your interview uh, on The New York Times. Uh, thank you on The Daily Podcast and, and eagerly read through your piece. It's phenomenal. Um, but you also have done some great reporting on these cell phone explosions, which to me were a shocking escalation in the tactics that the Israeli government is willing to use. Talk about that, because this feels like something very, very new, and I'm not sure it's not a war crime. Well, I'll leave the definition to, to someone else, but let me just put a few things in context. First of all, uh, Hamas has attacked Israel on uh, October 7, and this is a war, and Israel has retaliated with a very aggressive invasion into Gaza. Uh, shortly afterwards, and this war has been going on. Now, how is that connected to the north? It's connected because on the 8th, this is happening in the south of Israel, on the 8th of October last year, Secretary General of uh, Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, Hezbollah is the uh, most powerful militant force in Lebanon, launched a war on Israel as a solidarity with the Palestinian people and, the, uh, and Hamas. And Secretary General Nasrallah has promised, has obliged, has tied himself part of what is called the resistant front uh, with Iran, Nasrallah, with the Hamas, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. He has made the promise to Hamas that he will not stop the fire. He will not stop attacking Israel until Israel doesn't stop its war with Hamas. That war has been going on, and Prime Minister Netanyahu has been refusing to stop that war until uh, Israel eradicate Hamas. And this is also why we don't see the hostages being, being free. Now, what is Israel right. trying to do now is basically to force Hassan Nasrallah, to force Hezbollah to stand down and also agree to evacuate backwards from the border following uh, United Nations order from uh, almost 20 years ago, 1701, allowing, as you said before, allowing some 100,000 Israeli uh, refugees that had to evacuate their homes in the, the northern border of Israel to go back and do all of that, forcing Hezbollah to do all of that without ending the war, in, without Israel ending the war in the south. And Israel has been accelerating more and more aggressive moves against Hezbollah ever since. And the first mm -hmm. was to explode those pagers. The pagers were a means of communication. Uh, I'm not sure that all of your, uh, the new audience of your show know what pagers are, maybe now, uh, but this is something that was used in the 90s just to receive information. Yeah. This was the, the main core. This was the, 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 the issue, the, this was the, the advantage from this, the point of view of safety. It's only receiving information. It does not send information. And in, in Hezbollah, they thought this would be much safer because they believed Israel is hacking every phone. And Israel was able not to intercept the, the chain of supply, but Israel 
Israel intelligence, according to many of our sources in the New York Times, in the story we did with, uh, we did with uh, Shira Franken, my colleague, they became the chain of command, they, the chain of supply, they manufacture using front companies, they manufacture the devices, supply some 4,500 of them to Hezbollah right. and exploded that, yeah. as you said, last Tuesday. Let me, we, we have very little time, but I wanted to get to some of your other reporting, because this, to me, it speaks to a sort of escalation in a kind of search for, like, endless war. Talk very briefly, if you could, about what's happening in the West Bank, um, because there are extremists there that seem to also now kind of run the government, and they do yes. seem to not feel they have any limits on what they're able to do. This this government, Prime Minister Netanyahu, in order to become the prime minister back two years ago, has tied himself to an extreme ultra-right coalition. And that ex extreme ultra-right coalition, now led by uh, someone who was convicted in incitement to racism and terrorism, and another person who advocates the most racist uh, views, is basically trying to cripple the Palestinian Authority, doing nothing to prevent Jewish terrorism, and basically taking steps to secretly annex the West Bank, promote Jewish settlement in the fastest pace possible, and do whatever they can to destroy the Palestinian Authority. And all of these have only one, this is the, 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 the parts of a recipe that would lead to only one thing, which is the explosion of the West Bank, Third Intifada, yeah. a new front for, for Israel, and an endless, yeah. endless war, as you said. Um I, I, I could talk to you, honestly, for an hour. So I'm going to ask you to please come back, Ronan Bergman. You're an excellent reporter. Thank you so much for being here. And we'll bring you back another time. We'll be right back. Cheers. On Friday, South Carolina carried out its first death row execution in 13 years. Freddie Owens was convicted of killing a convenience store clerk during a robbery in 1997. But a key witness, whose testimony helped convict Owens, later said in a sworn statement that he lied and that Owens did not kill the clerk. Both the South Carolina governor and state Supreme Court denied a last-ditch request to intervene. And tomorrow night in Missouri, Ms. Marcellus Williams is scheduled to face the same fate. After hearing arguments earlier today, the Missouri Supreme Court ordered the state to carry out Williams' execution, even as several questions are still being raised about his conviction in a 1998 murder, including from a St. Louis prosecutor, Attorneys for Williams still have an appeal before the U.S. Supreme Court. And joining me now is Trisha Rojo Bushnell, executive director at the Midwest Innocence Project and an attorney for Marcellus Williams. Um, Ms. Bushnell, thank you so much for being here. I'll, I'll first ask, how is um, Mr. Williams doing? Um, how is he holding up and how is his family and what is the status of his request for clemency? Yes, I mean, it's an incredibly difficult time, as you can imagine, um, both preparing for what we all hope won't happen, but also still trying to have hope. I mean, this is actually the third time that Mr. Williams has been in this position and his execution has been stayed twice before. Uh, at this moment in time, you asked about executive clemency. We did find out earlier today that Governor Parson has declined to extend any clemency. Uh, so at this moment, we're still litigating. We have two cases pending between the U.S. Supreme Court and are still considering any other options. I, I will note that um, the family of the victim um, defines closure, they said, as Marcellus being allowed to live. So Ms. Gale's family did support the request. Pearson, the governor, has not granted clemency to anyone facing execution in six years, and 11 people have been executed in Missouri during that time. This would be the third execution this year, the 100th since the state of Missouri resumed um, executions in 1989. The Supreme Court, uh, it only very rarely grants clemency. Um, this, this is not a court that is uh, defined by mercy. Um, how hopeful are you that, that this conservative, ultra-conservative Supreme Court would, would um, do so in this case? Well, this is an extraordinary case. This isn't just a request to a court to step in. This is a request from a prosecutor 
himself. So the very office that secured Mr. Williams' conviction and his death sentence now concedes that his trial was unfair, uh, that it was marred by racial discrimination, and that there was other procedures that the prosecutor shouldn't have taken that contaminated the evidence. That's an extraordinary measure. And I think when we're thinking here where we have a prosecutor who wants this conviction overturned, who filed a motion to overturn this conviction, a victim's family who doesn't want an execution to go forward, surely we have to believe that we have a criminal legal system that would satisfy that, that would come to a just result. Um, and honestly, it, we have seen those those uh, stays granted before. This is not much different than the case of Mr. Richard Glossop in Oklahoma, whose execution, uh, who the U.S. Supreme Court granted review in his case because the Oklahoma attorney general agreed that there was constitutional error in his case that the lower courts didn't consider. So we're in that same place where, you know, it's an extraordinary time to have the prosecutor here uh, conceding error. And, and that's what we're asking the courts to review. And I do want to note that in this case, the errors in question are black jurors being excluded such that he would not have a jury of his peers. Uh, and also, as you said, the contamination of the evidence they wanted. There was a desire to reexamine the knife used in the case for DNA, but the evidence was mishandled. So that couldn't happen. I also note that since 1973, more than two, at least 200 people who've been wrongly convicted and sentenced to death in the U.S. have been exonerated. Over 41 percent of death row inmates are black, even though black folks make up only 13 percent of the population. Uh, only 55 countries still use the death penalty, and we are among uh, those, China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and the United States. Um, this feels like a, a case in which the governor is hard-hearted in this instance. Has, has there been any explanation to Mr. Marcel's family as to why the governor does not believe he needs clemency or deserves it? <laughs> The answer we often hear is that, you know, the faith in the criminal justice system, that these jurors already found this right and that you have to uphold the rule of law. But what we know in a case, especially like this, not only does the prosecutor support this, not only does the victim family support uh, and not uh, stopping an execution, the jurors themselves who were on this trial when presented with the new evidence also don't want an execution to go forward. So it's really just an extraordinary time when Individuals, when faced with the new evidence, when faced with the errors that the system has committed, everyone wants to fix this, except it appears the attorney general in the state of Missouri. I want to read something from Justice Sonia Sotomayor, who wrote about her fierce dissent in a death penalty case. This is from January of 2021. This is while Trump was still in office. Trump, who very much supports the death penalty and used it a lot, like in the last waning months of his camp, of his presidency, executed something like five people. Well, uh, Ms. Sotomayor said this is an unprecedented rush of federal executions. It meant that the federal government will have executed more than three times as many people in the last six months than it had in the previous six decades. She said this is not justice. Uh, what message would you send to the uh, other members of the Supreme Court, particularly the six ultra conservatives, as they consider Mr. Marcellus's life? I think it's what we would all believe, irrespective of anyone's opinion on the death penalty. If we're going to have the death penalty and we're going to enact it, everyone deserves a fair opportunity for their case to be heard fully and on the facts. That is what Mr. Williams has been asking for. And that is what has been denied. His name is Marcellus Williams. Uh, we are praying and hoping that he is still with us uh, tomorrow and with his family very soon. Uh, Trisha Rojo Bushnell, thank you for all that you do. We really appreciate it. And that is tonight's readout.